Hi, welcome to um, my talk on post quantum signal key agreement with SIDH. Um, this is a joint work with my supervisor, Stephen Galbraith from the University of Auckland. So um, obviously the elephant in the room to start off is um, the fact that there's been new attacks on SIDH since we submitted this paper um, to the conference. Um, specifically these um, attacks that recover the SIDH secret key isogeny in polynomial time using the um, public torsion points that are um, published in a public key. Um, so we want to point out that there have been countermeasures that have been proposed already for um, protecting against these types of attacks in two veins, um, masking the images of the points themselves or masking the degree of the isogenies that are used. Um, however, we believe that the paper that we've published is um, it does contain results of independent interest, um, specifically around the security of um, signal, the security model and um, other properties. So um, hopefully it will be of independent interest, even if SIDH doesn't turn out to be secure. Um, so with that said, a quick overview of this talk. Um, I will quickly go through um, the original signal X3DH protocol and then how we construct the um, SIDH variant of that. I'll then talk about the security proof and some of the reduction techniques that we um, have used to prove security of our protocol, um, which might be applicable to, to other results, other protocols. Um, and then I'll close with some conclusions. So as an overview, Signal has um, two main stages, components. Um, there's the initial key agreement protocol, which is called X3DH, or Extended Triple Diffie-Hellman. Mm -hmm. um, and that is used for two parties to establish a shared key, a shared secret key. Um, and then from that point on, messages can be sent, and the double ratchet protocol is used to continuously update that shared secret key um, after each participant sends messages um, so that we can achieve um, forward and backward secrecy. Um, and so um, security properties, important security properties of signal X3DH or the signal protocol in general um, is that it's correct. So both parties derive the same shared secret. Um, the secret should be secret. So um, an adversary that observes the exchange shouldn't be able to learn anything about it. Um, the protocol should implicitly authenticate both parties um, so that they know who they're talking to. I've got perfect forward secrecy so that um, if at a later stage your device or keys are compromised, um, adversaries can't go back and read all your previous messages. Um, asynchronicity, or sometimes called receiver obliviousness, which means that a receiver can upload their keys to a server and anyone can send them messages even if they're offline. Um, and then we've got finally deniability, or specifically offline deniability, which basically means that um, no one can prove um, in a non-reputable way that you were involved with a specific um, session of the protocol. So how do we make signal post-quantum? Um, the double ratchet part is actually fairly straightforward. This is already a known work, um, how to make this part post-quantum with chems. However, the initial key agreement part, replacing X3D8, is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more going on there with um, multiple different keys from each party. So some previous work on this, um, we've got the work by Brendel et al. in 2020, um, designing a potential way of doing this using what they call split chems. However, it's theoretical work. There's no actual um, secure instantiations of these split chems that we know of. Um, they suggest Seaside might be a possibility, but that requires further analysis. Um, and then there's two concrete chem-based schemes, the SPQR and the signal SCAKE um, protocols. And so um, both of these protocols, actually, they're, they're fairly similar to each other, um, and they both require a, um, a expensive post-quantum ring signature or designated verifier signature um, to achieve deniability, because both of these protocols require um, one of the parties signing something like the session ID. And so in order for that not to be a, a non-reputable piece of evidence 
for deniability, um, that signature has to be done with like a ring signature or a designated verifier signature. Um, and also the SCAKE protocol doesn't have any um, semi-static keys that um, signal X3DH does. So I'll get to that in a minute, but um, essentially with only long-term and ephemeral keys, it kind of loses some of the flexibility that signal has about uploading lots of ephemeral keys to a server, but still being able to receive messages even if all of those keys run out. Um, so that's just another little, little complication there. Um, so what we were interested in is using SIDH, um, which resembles the, the normal Diffie-Hellman protocol um, quite strongly um, to, to make signal post-quantum. Um, however, the important point was that SIDH is actually vulnerable to adaptive attacks, um, well, at least its original form was um, before it was broken. And so um, our protocol needs to basically, um, all, of, all of the effort in our protocol is really just to make sure that these adaptive attacks are prevented. Um, so what is the adaptive attack? What is the GPST attack? Um, Essentially, it means that a participant can take their public key and maliciously modify the two torsion points that are part of their public key so that when they give that public key to the other party for the key exchange, um, that other party will try and compute a shared secret. And if those two shared secrets match or, or don't match at the end of this um, computation, um, the, the adversary can learn one bit of their secret. The, the other party's secret key. And so by doing this repeatedly, 128 times, you'll learn all of a 128-bit um, secret key. And how this is typically prevented is either by using something like an FO transform um, to prove correctness of the public key, but obviously this can only be done with ephemeral keys because you actually reveal the secret um, at the end of the exchange. So if you want long-term keys, we can use something like a proof of knowledge, like the one presented um, in DDGZ21, which is at AsiaCrypt. So the Signal X3DH protocol, this is the original one. So the sender has two keys. The sender is Alice on the left. Um, they've got an identity key, which is long-term, and an ephemeral key, which is single use. And then Bob, the receiver on the right, has three keys. Well, the, the third one is optional. This um, dashed box means optional. So the identity key, again, long-term, a semi-static key, which is not long-term. It's regularly rotated, but it isn't ephemeral, meaning it's not just for one key exchange. It can be reused. And then we've got an optional ephemeral key at the bottom, um, which is just one use. And so the extended triple part of this um, this name means that there's actually multiple Diffie-Hellman exchanges going on here. So we do a first Diffie-Hellman exchange between these two keys, the second Diffie-Hellman exchange between these two keys, third and fourth. So we end up with, so again, the fourth one is optional just if the ephemeral key is present. So we end up with three or four um, Diffie-Hellman shared secrets from different combinations of each party's keys. And then those Three or four Diffie-Hellman secrets are then combined using some sort of key, key derivation function or hash function to give a single shared secret for the um, initial key agreement phase of signal. So if we want to drop SIDH in as a replacement for Diffie-Hellman, what happens with adaptive attacks here? So the first part of it between the two ephemeral keys is fine because there is no point attacking an ephemeral key with um, an adaptive attack. You can learn one bit of an ephemeral key and then it's never used again. So that's fine. We don't have to worry about that part. Um, if we then introduce the FO transform on EKA to protect against um, adaptive attacks there, so Bob doesn't have to worry about um, Alice attacking his IKB or SKB using EKA, um, this just requires Alice to send a small FO proof um, along with PKA. And so that makes all three of those, um, those branches of this exchange safe now. Um, and so the final one that we need is um, DH1, which is between two longer term keys. 
So we can't use an FO proof here because we don't want either party to have to reveal their secret key to the other participant. So what we propose instead of using this exchange between these two is to instead do an exchange between the two identity keys for DH1. And what this um, allows us is that instead of um, having, and so that instead we can use a proof of knowledge of both of these identity keys um, to prove that they're correct. And that only needs to be verified once and only computed and sent once for each contact in your um, contact list rather than using SKB, which gets regularly rotated. So we wouldn't want to use a proof of knowledge on that key um, because it would be quite inefficient. So now onto the security model. Um, we've designed the security model in the context of the CK type models, so CK plus ECK models, um, with this case-based analysis um, that shows that the exactly where um, the original signal X3DH protocol doesn't meet the strong requirements of the CK plus or ECK models. Um, because we really want to capture the exact security of this original signal X3DH protocol rather than um, designing a model which is actually stronger than that. Um, and so what we did was we first analyzed exactly where um, the signal X3DH protocol breaks down in this model. And by going through the different events, um, which if you've seen um, CK type models before, then this will look familiar to you. But if not, then um, essentially it's just each row is a different combination of keys which the adversary can reveal. And we want to make sure that um, even with these different combinations of keys being revealed, that the shared secret you end up with overall is still um, indistinguishable from random. So we've identified that um, these bottom two um, cases are exactly the ones where in the original signal protocol, if the adversary reveals these combinations of keys and they can compute the shared secret. Um, and so we want to exclude these two cases from the model, but keep all of these first six cases um, which are satisfied by signal and therefore should be satisfied by any replacement of signal. Um, and you can see that we have um, included this new column for the semi-static key in here, which hasn't been done before in the CK models because um, signal is quite unique in the fact that it has these three keys rather than just long and ephemeral keys. Um, and we provide some reasoning for the specific combinations um, of where we've chosen to allow the semi-static key to be revealed or not um, in the paper. So just to compare this to previous work, um, so the SCAKE protocol um, by Hashimoto et al. in um, this first one that uses a strong CK type model, um, which is actually stronger than um, what Signal X3DH would satisfy. So it's, it's a fairly standard CK type model. Um, uh, however, it doesn't use semi-static keys. So that's where um, our protocol is kind of unique in that, or our, our model is kind of unique in that it does take into account these semi-static keys in the context of the CK type model um, and, and is exactly something that Signal X3DH would satisfy. Um, Brendel et al. Um, also um, have their own model, um, which is a custom model. Um, based on like Valier Rogaway key indistinguishability as well. Um, however, all of that model and terminology and everything is quite um, unique. Um, they use quite non-standard terminology compared to the CK type models, um, which makes it difficult to compare and difficult to understand whether this protocol does provide guarantees such as um, perfect forward secrecy, key compromise integrity, and maximal exposure properties that, that the CK type model kind of um, explicitly discusses. So we hope that the security model that we've provided is um, independently interesting, um, even if the SIDH part of our paper isn't necessarily secure. Um, and we also provide some new reduction techniques um, to prove security of signal of our, our new protocol. Um, so as you might be aware, um, there is no gap Diffie-Hellman type assumption in the isogeny setting. Um, there's a 
a pretty cool result that basically shows that if you can decide whether an isogeny of a certain degree exists between two curves, then you can use that oracle um, to recover the secret. So really the, um, the decisional problem actually allows you to compute the, the secret. Um, and so the original analysis, formal analysis of the signal X3DH protocol by Cohen Gordon et al. Um, in 2020 um, proves security based on gap diffie Hellman. And we want to be able to prove um, security of our protocol based on a computational assumption um, since we don't have this gap assumption. And we do that by introducing a couple of new um, co computational problems that reduce down from um, standard computational SIDH problems um, and then use those to prove security that gives our protocol overall a reduction on a computational problem. The first of these is the verifiable computational problem, which essentially gives us a really weak oracle fixed on two keys that just says, is the shared secret for those two keys correct or not? So you can give it um, a J invariant, which is a SIDH shared secret, um, and it will just say yes or no, is it correct? Um, so it's a super weak version of a um, of a decisional oracle because we can't change these keys. We've just given this one fixed oracle. So it's basically a point hiding function, um, and we can show that that if you can break, if you can compute the J invariant with this extra information, this extra oracle then you can break it without the oracle. Um, and then the second problem we introduce is the honest computational problem, which basically introduces an FO proof into the um, computational problem. So as well as getting uh, two keys in your, in your challenge instance, you also get an FO proof that one of those keys is correct. Um, and again, we show that if you can break this problem, then you can just break the original um, computational problem without the FO proof. And so together, both of these problems allow us to prove um, security of our new signal protocol, um, SIX3DH, um, and on, based on computational assumptions alone, standard computational assumptions. Um, and this might be of independent interest as well, because um, for example, if you wanted to introduce just the small FO proof into the original signal X3DH protocol, um, then you could use pretty much exactly the same techniques to prove that that original signal protocol um, in the random oracle model um, is secure um, against, um, is, is secure based on computational rather than gap assumptions. So then just to close finally, um, we do want to just point out that other than the questions around SIDH's security currently, um, that the biggest drawback of our scheme does come from the um, potential inefficiency of the proof of knowledge on the long-term identity keys used by the participants. Um, and so this definitely needs to be studied more, um, and there's definitely room for more efficient proofs of knowledge for SIDH or the newer variants of SIDH. Um, so that's a really interesting area of work if anyone's interested. Um, but other than those proofs of knowledge, which um, are just on the identity keys, just need to be verified once per contact, the actual online part of the exchange is actually really compact. Um, we've just got the really short key sizes of SIDH um, and then this, this small extra FO proof that we introduced. And that's the only difference from, from the transcript size of a signal x 3 protocol. So this is actually quite a nice um, small replacement and online exchange. Um, so yeah, we hope that the phrasing of the security model as well um, in the CK plus type sense is useful for um, analyzing other protocols as well. Um, and the fact that we've introduced the semi-static key into those CK type models, um, we hope that that's useful. Um, and then we also finally hope that there is a secure, secure variant of SIDH that can be used. So um, please go and cryptanalyze these new, these new pro protocols that have been proposed um, and see if they are actually secure. Thanks very much for your attention.